Free Media, I'm Robbie Suave. And I'm Amber Duke. CNN's Aaron Burnett was stunned to learn that Kamala Harris is on the record as having supported publicly funded gender transition surgery for detained illegal migrants. Here was Burnett reacting to a report by CNN's K-File. This questionnaire is really uh, an interesting snapshot in time of that 2019 Democratic primary. Uh, Kamala Harris was trying to get to the left uh, of Bernie Sanders. She was trying to get to the left of Elizabeth Warren. And you really see that in a lot of these answers. And I want to walk our viewers through a little bit of what she said. Let's just take uh, immigration and look at what she said here. She said on immigration, she made this open-ended pledge uh, to end immigrant detention. She said she supported uh, taxpayer-funded gender transition surgeries for detained migrants. She also said she Taxpayer supported- Taxpayer-funded gender transition surgeries for detained migrants. For detained migrants. She actually said she, she supported that. She wrote, both wrote and answered in the affirmative when she was asked this. Oh. And she said she also supported it uh, for federal prisoners. Now, she also pledged to slash immigration detention by 50%, close all family and private facilities, and decrease funding for ICE, and then the end, uh, end, end uh, ICE detainers uh, with local law enforcement. I mean, these are these are things that, you know, it would be hard to think that you would come up with taxpayer mm-hmm. funding gender transitions for uh, for detained migrants. Uh, the best part of that is clearly Aaron Burnett's surprise. Like, wait, she said what? Why did she? <laughs> who made her say that? Uh, we, and the answer is the ACLU. It was a questionnaire that she enthusiastically answered in the affirmative back in, you know, the 2019-2020 cycle when she was a candidate for president. In the for the Democratic nomination alongside the eventual winner, Joe Biden, and these other people, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, Amy Klobuchar, et cetera. It's a good reminder of that moment in sort of political history when Democrats were forced to embrace, regardless of what you think about them, policies that clearly would not be popular, are not popular, were not popular then, are definitely not popular now. Now they know they're not popular, so they're running away from them. But man, that is a hard thing to have to run away from gender transition surgeries publicly funded for um, illegal migrants. Yeah, if CNN can't even hide their shock that someone would support that position, you know that there's a serious problem. And this ACLU questionnaire that was resurfaced by K-File is really just further indication that Kamala Harris was the most liberal senator. She was adopting very progressive far left policy positions during this primary. And it is totally valid and legitimate to ask how she has suddenly gotten to where she is in 2024, where she's disavowing all of these positions through anonymous campaign officials or uh, through statements that she makes to the press. And even in this interview that she did with CNN's Dana Bash, didn't explain really how she got from one set of policies to another and even insisted that her values hadn't changed which is just made it all the more confusing that there was this radical policy transition in a matter of just four or five years. Yeah, there was definitely a change. I mean, I think, again, it goes to show you what Democrats were forced to embrace because of the kind of very uh, culturally, socially liberal values of elite media and elite democratic forces that that pushed them to that, you know, not knowing all, that all that stuff would end up being so um, unpopular. And then not having to actually run a campaign this time around, you know, we're, we're calling on the what she, what she said she would do, what her policy positions were from the previous election cycle, because she didn't have to do any of that this time. She just got away with being coronated the nominee by the elites in her party. And now we're in a position where we're finding out what does she actually believe? And did she not believe those things back when she said them? What's even more challenging for her is that the Biden administration's record has her fingerprints all over it. She was a tie-breaking vote in the Senate as the chairman of the Senate being vice president for quite some time and was actually pushing through and voting for policies that were in line with those 2019 positions. So for example, she now claims that she doesn't support an electric vehicle mandate, but she did in 2019. She changed her mind on it, but not only did she co-sponsor legislation while in the Senate that was an electric vehicle mandate, but while serving in the Biden administration, voted for the Inflation Reduction Act, which implemented all kinds of new EPA rules that would force vehicle manufacturers to reduce their fleet of gas-powered vehicles and start ramping up production of EVs and hydrogen-fueled cars, effectively an EV mandate because of the massive restrictions on CO2 emissions from cars. 
So K-File did, uh, that's Andrew Kaczynski, the um, CNN reporter, did some good work here. Um, I, I think he, and it's funny because he doesn't fashion himself as like a misinformation reporter, and he's been at this a while, and he actually does, in my view, f call out people on both sides and both traditions, yet he did exposés on Republican officials who's like plagiarized aspects of their books or things like that. But he's also found these past statements from Democrats. And, uh, you know, they're, they're like, there are people in the mainstream who do that work. They're just never actually in the media criticism and misinformation and all of that beat. Those people are partisan hacks time and time again. Yeah, he sort of has made his own beat, which is basically just digging through internet yeah. archives and old documents to see what people said five, 10 years ago, and not even in the vein of cancel culture typically. I think that's kind right. of how K-File started, but since uh, I would say over the past few years, it's gotten more focused on policy positions or stated positions from politicians as opposed to digging up, like uh, I think he did a couple of reports on people that were appointed to the Trump administration and was like, oh, they said this nasty thing back in 2000. Yeah. And it's gotten a little bit away from that, which I think is a good thing. But generally speaking, he actually does real investigative work instead of the typical misinformation right. reporter gaslighting where uh, because a right winger said it, we're going to pretend it's not true and ignore all right. the evidence that could potentially support it. He's actually just looking at what people have said or written. Megan McArdle of the Washington Post, I saw her reflecting um, on social media the other day that um, she thinks cancel culture has ebbed or, or the ability to cancel people has decreased because now that Twitter is a more just kind of conservative space in general, there was a tremendous flight from the platform after Elon Musk acquired it of the people who did the canceling. And then the, the, the forces in sort of media and like progressive institutions that then that then listen to these, the cancellation mobs or whatever online, like those people don't care anymore. Like they're, they're not on Twitter anymore. So it, it's like lacks the cultural canceling power. I thought that was a, probably a pretty good observation. That is interesting. I think it's that coupled with the conservative movement being willing to actually stand up for people mm -hmm. who are in the midst of cancellations, whereas before they would kind of be like, oh, well, I don't really like what that person said, even though they're my friend, blah, blah, blah. Now it's like full-throated defense, if not going on offense against the person who tries to do the canceling. And that has rendered a lot of this moot because you can't cancel conservatives if conservative institutions sure. are not willing to go along with it. And businesses, I think, have realized that no one cares, that you yeah. don't have to, they don't have to listen to the angriest, most thin-skinned person on whatever social media site, that now that person isn't even on Twitter, they're on Blue Sky or Threads or something, <laughs> right. and no yeah. one, it's just total irrelevance, and you can just go about life Just and wait a fine. few days, it'll yeah. all blow over. It's a, it's a good thing that has taken place in that regard. More free media coming up next. Thank you